for the return of a new series of dispatches. These men are members of a paedophile gang who tortured and killed a young boy. Most will soon be out of prison. Sidney Cook was the leader of the gang, yet he's already a free man and already has plans for the gang to meet again. They are killers and they kill for sexual pleasure. It's as simple as that. Cook was jailed so that children would be protected from him. Now he's at liberty. How safe are they? Mar Hindi, Ian Brady, most sex offenders are locked up for life because they know, we know they present a danger to the public. He's 71, but still a sexual threat. He will never ever stop abusing children. He has an incredible sexual appetite. And, and even now, I, I am certain that he will need some sort of sexual gratification. Good evening. Programs involving the police are usually searching for a culprit, but tonight's a unique event because the officers in this room make no secret of their prime suspect. For years, Sidney Cook haunted fairs, amusement arcades, seaside pleasure parks, wherever children gather, places where your children may have been. Cook has been convicted of the killing of one child. The police believe that he cheated justice by not receiving a life sentence for that crime and then getting his sentence reduced, and that they have evidence linking him to the murder of two other children for which he's never been held to account. Tonight we'll examine that evidence and we'll be appealing for anyone with further information about the gang's activities to ring the police here on this number. As members of the gang complete their jail sentences, there's a debate about what to do with paedophiles at liberty. But the real question is, should Sidney Cook be free at all? Tonight we expose a failure in British justice which the police believe leaves our children at risk. We discover more victims of the gang who they didn't kill, but whose lives they still destroyed. A young man speaks out for the first time about what he says Sidney Cook did to him 13 years ago. He wants to help, but he's so damaged that he can only talk about it through his sister. I keep being shown him that it's not his fault all the time, that he's not the bad one. He's the victim, that is, he never asked for it to happen. Terry, you're still scared of Sid? Mm. Terry, like many victims of abuse, finds it agonizingly difficult to speak out about what happened to him. So, are there others who have suffered at the hands of Cook, but who have still kept it a terrible secret? The police want this information and they want you to call them on this free telephone number. Miscarriages of justice aren't always about the innocent, the wrongly convicted. Many argue that the fact that Sidney Cook is a free man is itself a miscarriage of justice. In the course of this investigation, I've heard things that'll haunt me for a very long time. But tonight, we're not going into the harrowing details. The fear that justice may not have been done is a dreadful enough story in itself. Soon as the young boy went in the bedroom, Cookie followed him back two minutes after. In this program, for the first time, we present evidence of the gang's activities tape-recorded confessions that, until now, have never been disclosed. Cookie told the young boy to undress. A voice from the grave that implicates Sidney Cook in the killing of two more children. I heard Cookie say he was going to have sex with the boy. This is the Kingsmead. It's a tough East London estate. In the 80s, with high unemployment, poverty and violence, it was even tougher. Problem families all was put on the King's Beach, you know what I mean? It's an absolute dump, basically. Like people getting arrested, lots of fights, lots of gang fights, that sort of thing. There was nothing to find somebody who'd got knifed or something like that. There was always something going on. It was a more like a transit camp. You could be talking to somebody today uh, and they'd gone tomorrow. But there was one flat where the residents stayed put. It was the headquarters of a gang of paedophiles. In 1985, a teenager called Jason Swift moved into the Kingsmead. He was shy and short of money. 
Jason was attractive and vulnerable. He found company and cash by selling his body to men. Jason caught the eye of another resident of the Kingsmead, a fairground worker called Sidney Cook. He always sort of had a scruffy suit on and a trilby hat. He wasn't very much to look at at all. Just a thin, everyday, small character that um, wouldn't be taken a second glance at. But John Purvo, who also worked on the fairs, had special reason to remember Cook. He'd sold him a Jaguar car for £400. But Cook hadn't kept up with the payments. In the end, I turned around and said to him, like, if you ain't going to pay properly, I'll take the car back. John Purvo went round to Sidney Cook's flat on the Kingsmead to repossess the car. I saw one boy there who he, he turned around and told me was his nephew. I saw this boy with him a couple of times, actually. This boy who he said was his nephew, recognise him? I do now. Now I know him as Jason Swift, but I didn't at the time. Jason Swift did not have long to live. I also saw this same boy in a car, my car, because I was working with somebody who was coming down near King's Cross and I saw the car. We followed him down and I got out and I pulled him out of the car looking for money again. The boy, Jason Swift, was in the car with him then. On a dark November night, 13 years ago, Jason went to that flat on the Kingsmead estate. A group of men had each paid five pounds to have sex with him. He walked up this dingy stairwell to where the men had gathered. After a few hours, he was dead. Police found Jason's body a few days later. It was lying in a shallow grave on the outskirts of London. A post-mortem report showed Jason had been subjected to a cruel and prolonged sexual attack and then strangled. Leading the hunt for Jason's killer was Detective Superintendent David Bright. I cannot think of anything worse that could happen to, to a human being and to a vulnerable young man. The most despicable and horrible offences that you could ever imagine one human being committing on another. Police knew the Jason Swift case would be hard to crack. Who would champion a rent boy? Who would admit to a part in his buggery and death? Astonishingly, one man was only too willing to do just that and to gloat over his part in the crime. During wider inquiries into paedophile crimes, Leslie Bailey was picked up on the Kingsmead by police. Dispatches has uncovered a history of Bailey's sexual abuse. People like Paul, who, as a child, was left in Bailey's care and has now agreed to speak out. He was a, a friend of the family. I mean, loads of people knew him. So he was just here, here and everywhere. It was just like my mum knew him. My whole family knew him. What Paul's family didn't know is that Bailey was a paedophile and their son his victim. And he used to babysit. I mean, like, my mum would say, uh, oh, Leslie, can you look after the kids for a couple of hours while I go shopping or whatever she had to do? Paul never told his parents that Bailey fondled him. He thought grown-ups just behaved like that. I knew adults made love and done whatever. So I thought he was like a guide, helping me out sort of thing, telling me that I was, it's OK to do these sort of things. And obviously I can't turn back the clock and say it never happened, but there's a lot of anger there. I mean, what I know now, I would have... I would have told somebody. I wish I could, could have told somebody. Bailey wasn't the only child molester on the estate, and his activities didn't stop at fondling. Bailey told the police investigating the Jason Swift case that he, with others, had buggered and killed the boy in a flat on the Kingsmead. Among the gang, Sidney Cook. It was a filthy, stinking, awful flat. If in your worst nightmare you try and conjure up a, a room where such an event would occur, that would fit the bill. Cook and the others were interviewed. After days of intensive questioning, the full horror of Jason's death began to emerge. At the prison interviews, as an independent witness, was a Salvation Army officer, Derek Tribble. In 73-plus years, 
I would say he was the most evil man I've ever met. And uh, to hear all that he had done and taken place was the most evil thing I've ever heard of. Superintendent Bright conducted the interviews. Sydney, we have been to... Cook's only power was in telling or keeping secret the terrible truth. And he loved it. He's a cunning, devious individual. He's a wicked person, but he gives off this, uh, this presence of creepiness. That's a childish word, but that's my immediate impression of him. I told you I know nothing. These were interviews over a number of days, so there wasn't an immediate uh, confession from him. In fact, it was extremely hard work. After three days of toying with the police, Cook did confess. He said they hadn't meant to kill Jason, it just happened. He eventually went down on the floor and assumed the position of the kneeling position and praying. Then he then uh, against a chair. He then laid on the floor and, and, and put out his body in like a crucifix. Uh, very theatrical, very dramatic. Um, my elation and, and delight was that during the course of this he admitted it and only the people there would know and he then went into detail of what had occurred. Detail of the lengthy, repeated and desperate suffering forced on Jason Swift. Do you know what I mean? Do you know what I mean? His last hours must have been virtually hell. The pain that he had to endure, beggar's description, uh, until eventually he, he died. And uh, this will live with me for forever. No one could prove that Jason died at the hand of any one gang member, so they were charged not with murder, but manslaughter. Manslaughter can mean a life sentence, but Cook, although the acknowledged ringleader, was sentenced to 19 years. Given that Cook was 62, the police were happy to settle for the sentence he got. I thought that is a good result in as much as that Cook Children will be safe, that's the most important fact. He's not going to get any other children for a long period of time. And I thought he would die in prison. August 1989. At London's Wandsworth prison, a prison officer was approached by an inmate who wanted to share some information. Things he'd heard from the prisoner in the bunk below. Accounts that he'd written down in a notebook. A squalid torrent of detail from a man who seemed to be reveling in his memories of the rape and murder of children. That man was Leslie Bailey. What he did, he would sit and talk to Bailey, and he kept notes. He kept a book, a notebook, under his pillow, and he would tell Bailey, because Bailey was a bit simple, that he was writing a book about his experiences in prison, and late in the evening he would write up the notes of conversations that had occurred that day. Roger Stoodley, a chief superintendent based in the east end of London, sent a detective down to see their informant. We dispatched a detective inspector to the prison, who was disguised, if you like the word, as, as a vicar. Um, and so it was going to be a pastoral visit to so that there would be no suspicion falling on him at that stage that he was given evidence. Almost every day, the informant would send Bailey's outpourings back to the police by letter. It was the gold mine. I mean, his, he was a very prolific note writer. We were receiving almost daily communications from him. Um, some of them were plaintive because he was... Uh, he was having to listen to stories of, of horrific crimes. Prisoners hate grasses almost as much as child killers. Out of concern for their source's safety, the police halted the undercover operation. But the information they'd already received was priceless. Information about other child rapes and murders. As we checked up on that information, as we proved what he was saying was right, we knew then that we had the first, if you like, of a stepping stone into these men. And the next thing from was then to interview and to get into some of these characters. This is an interview with Leslie Bailey. Police confronted Bailey with what he'd said. Far from denying it, what Bailey began to unfold was a devastating catalogue of buggery and murder. We've listened to the 50 hours of those recorded interviews which we acquired from independent sources. Bailey implicated Sidney Cook in the killing of two boys. 
The tapes are such horrifying and detailed testimony to rape and murder by the gang that only fragments can be broadcast. Leslie, I understand through your solicitor that there are other matters which you wish to discuss with us. Is that correct? Yeah. Where would you like to start? I was two up with Sydney Cook, same cell. He started drawing, telling me about her boys. The police decided to ask Bailey about another unsolved child murder. Shortly after Jason Swift's body was found, and close to it, another naked, lifeless body was discovered, hurriedly buried in a shallow grave and covered with leaves. The child was six years old. His name was Barry Lewis. Could Bailey solve the riddle of Barry's death? I just said, tell me about Barry Lewis. And he said to us, I killed him. And there was a feeling of, in that room by everybody, even him, I think, where there was this silence and you suddenly felt the room close in a bit on you. Bailey told the police that the six-year-old had been drugged, raped and left for dead by the gang. Critically for the police, he said Sidney Cook was one of the men involved. Bailey, given the job of disposing of the tiny body, bundled it into the back of a car and drove to the outskirts of London. Bailey, I believe this, generally believed the boy was dead. By the time he got to where he buried the boy, the boy was awake, looking out the back window, calling for his mother. Leslie Bailey suffocated the little boy. The police believe they had a cast-iron case against Bailey, but the police don't bring prosecutions. That's the job of the Crown Prosecution Service, the CPS. And the CPS, at first, seemed cautious about his confession. They didn't think it would stand up. I was shocked. I said quite forcibly that they've got to look at the evidence that we've presented to them, that it is strong enough to put before a court, that it is the type of case that must go to a jury. At that meeting, did you physically stand up? I physically stood up. Is it true that you took them by the lapels? Um, there was physical contact, but it was needed. And what happened was the case was not discontinued. They were shocked by what, what had happened? I think they were shocked, yeah. They didn't expect, didn't expect me to respond in that way. The CPS had, to begin with, been reluctant to prosecute, yet once Bailey had actually been charged, he pleaded guilty and was convicted of murder. In his confession, Bailey had implicated Sidney Cook as a central member of the murderous paedophile gang. But Cook, already lucky to escape a life sentence, was to have even better fortune. He managed to manipulate the conviction of Bailey to secure his own early release from prison. In part two, how the police believe Cook hoodwinked the justice system. Meanwhile, if you have any information about Sidney Cook and his gang, the police would like you to call them. Most child sex killers suffer at the hands of other inmates. Cook, on the whole, seems to have lived a charmed life while in jail for the manslaughter of Jason Swift. An experimental regime at Albany Prison allowed him to order catalogues illustrated with pictures of children. It also integrated child killers like Cook with other villains like Kevin O'Dowd in prison for shooting a man. He was always on about um, children. He sent out for catalogues and that he, was, he was allowed to have those catalogues because he was making out, he was making um, knitting things for homeless people and all that. What did he want with the catalogues? Obviously, like, they had children in them, and uh, obviously, like, he's a paedophile, you know. The same experimental regime allowed a man like Cook to spend his time in jail making, of all things, toys for children. We was making toys for mentally handicapped and, and uh, children with learning disabled. In his prison cell, Cook heard about Bailey's confession. And although that confession implicated Cook in two other child killings, Cook seized it as the opportunity to get out of jail early. He appealed against his 19-year sentence for killing Jason Swift on the grounds that Bailey was the evil genius of the gang. The CPS had no right in law to oppose Cook's appeal against sentence. Cook's tactic worked. 
And nine years after his conviction, he was a free man. What impresses us most, with great respect to counsel, is what I hear called the Bailey factor. Bailey really is an ogre. The judge, upon the information before him, came to the conclusion that Cook was the ringleader. That, in our judgment, is a finding which can no longer stand. Bailey quite clearly was at least equal to Cook in every way. The 19 years came down to 16. That shouldn't be so, it might, and this is my opinion. And if in the 19 years had remained, he'd have still been behind bars somewhere. But is it true that Bailey was the gang's sadistic mastermind? It's organising genius. Couldn't organise a piss up in a brewery, basically. Um, he, you, you'd say something to him uh, and you'd go and do it. You know, he was sort of easily led. Basically, he was a golfer. If someone wanted him to do something, he would do it. He would be there straight away. And he, he, wasn't, he wasn't an intelligent person at all. I mean, he couldn't think for himself. But he's been portrayed as the mastermind, the ringleader. Oh, no, definitely not. Not at all. Totally opposite. In plain language, Bailey, and I spent a lot of time with him also, couldn't lead a thirsty horse to water. When he made his confessions to the police, Bailey had talked about the murder of a third boy, seven-year-old Mark Tilsley. And again, he'd implicated Sidney Cook. Mark Tildesley couldn't wait for the fair to come to town. And late one afternoon, he was finally there. Bright lights, the smell of candy floss, pockets jangling with the coins he'd been saving for months. Oh, he's always excited about the fair coming. He went to the fun fair while I was at work, and I'd come home and I said, where's Mark? So Dad said, oh, we've got to go and find him. He's at the fun fair, so we went to get him. We kept look, 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 and we couldn't see him. I see the bike chained up there. And I said to his father, we can't be far off. He's here somewhere, we're going to see. So we headed straight for the Dodson cars, because he used to like the Dodson cars. But Mark wasn't there either. It was quarter to ten at night, and we were still down there looking for him. We couldn't find him. and I went to the police and the policeman who was on duty said oh well if you can't, if he's not turned up by 11 o'clock will you come back mr and mrs tildesley never saw their son again mark's body has never been found we come down when my daughter comes his mother has no grave to visit all she has is a plaque in the churchyard We decided we'd uh, have a plaque for Mark so that we could sort of come down here and bring a few flowers and come down where it's quiet and just think. Because it's nice and quiet down here. So you don't know where he is though? No, I wish we did know. So at least it's a, it's a place to come, isn't it? Yes, it is. See? Yeah. Just to tell you in loving memory of Mark and his birthday. Mm -hmm. We're gentlemen now, isn't he? How old is he now? He's, he'll be 22 now. He'll be 22, will he? Yes, he will. So he'll be big now. The police say they never closed the files on an unsolved murder. But nearly 15 years on, the original files on Mark Tilsley's murder are gathering dust. Oh, yeah. Here's the uh, what the aerial view of the of the fair, at, at the time of the fairground. Of yes, the that's right. I documented all the caravans and the uh, the various shows and the rides. And the the bicycle was alongside the gate, just there. In fact, if you look closely, you can see the gate. This is Mark's bike. You still kept the bike, then, have you? Yes, yes. One of the exhibits. It's quite sad, isn't it? Yeah. It was only when Leslie Bailey began to blurt out the gang's obscene portfolio of crime that the police began to discover the full story of what happened to Mark on the day of his disappearance all those years ago. According to Bailey, Mark Tilsley had already met his killer when he left his bicycle at the fair, locking it with his distinctive S.O. Tiger keyring. 
Bailey said that Sidney Cook had told him to come to Wokingham that night. He'd found a boy. Cook had bought the boy's sweets and rides, far more than his pocket money would have stretched to. He was taken to a nearby caravan, where Bailey said Cook and others would rape and kill him. What happened to Mark then, once you got inside that caravan? The boy was sitting down. Well, Cook, he told him to sit down. How was he acting? He was, seemed a bit afraid, frightened. Bailey told detectives that Mark was then killed in the caravan. Cook said, leave the boy here, not in the easy caravan. So yeah. who said that? Cook. He said? He just sort the boy out. Who was sort the boy out? Cook. I'll be honest, it, it, it's, it's quite horrendous, as, as was the killing of, of all of them. Um, and it's something I, I don't think you could, you could ever put it on air. Although Bailey had named other men, his confession alone was not strong enough evidence oh. against them. So he alone was charged and convicted of Mark Tilsley's murder. One of the most the moving um, aspects uh, of, of Mark's uh, investigation, um, which virtually reduced me to tears, was um, when I told his, his father that we'd um, prosecuted, or we were going to, we charged Bailey uh, with, with the murder of Mark, so that he knew before, before it came out in the press and in the media. Um, he turned around, tears filled his eyes and said, I'm sorry, Mr. Short, until I've got a body, I will never ever accept he's dead. And that was, you know. The police couldn't accept that Leslie Bailey had masterminded the murder. They say they had solid evidence to link Sidney Cook to that night. In a moment, we'll review that evidence, and at the end of the program, we'll be sifting through the new information that's already coming through to us here as we continue our investigation into the life of Sidney Cook. We followed the trail of Cook through scores of small country fairgrounds across the southeast of England. It was also a journey back in time. One of the first witnesses we discovered was Ian Luckin. Good to see me. Back in the late 70s, Mr. Luckin had a travelling circus. He's left show business now, but he's never had the heart to part with his circus relics, including the lorry one of his casual employees used to drive, a man called Sidney Cook. He didn't wash, he was dirty, never cleaned his teeth or anything, that type of person. And his behaviour? Um, he used to tell a lot of lies. So you wouldn't trust him? No, no. You couldn't leave anything around, you know. He, he was sneaky, very sneaky person. Let's see if he's left any marks of himself behind yep. in this. Marks leading to the past of the man whose trail we were following. Old discarded letters and bills. S. Cook and Sons. Yeah, when he was in the demolition game, by the looks of it. He's applying for planning permission for demolition. Yeah. But uh, was he in the demolition game? No. What's all this about then? I don't know. I haven't the foggiest. And there was an innocent children's comic book on the seat of a van driven 25 years ago by Sidney Cook. A man, it seems, who even then was the object of some suspicion to others on the fairground circuit. On several occasions, uh, he was thrown out of the back of a wagon and there would be a kid with him in the back of the wagon. So the whisper was there was something a bit... Yeah. A bit odd? Yeah, well... It, I asked questions about it afterwards, and I was told, like, you know what I mean, he, he likes touching young kids and boys and stuff. And if you see him in the back of the wagon, I was told to literally throw him out of the wagon. Cook travelled all over the south of England with his child-sized Test Your Strength machine. He'd offer some children free rides on other fairground attractions. Does anyone watching tonight remember meeting Cook 15 or 20 years ago? or any incident involving him at a fairground. That's called the what? Trisha Nail certainly remembers Sidney Cook. Trisha's days on the fairground are over now and she's got some good memories, but Sidney Cook is not one of them. 
awful, horrible, greasy, slimy. We always used to refer to him as Hissing Sid for the simple reason that he, he was snake-like. He, was, he wasn't very nice to look at. You know, you'd sort of get... I mean, I could have been wrong, but it proved to be right. But he, he never had a savoury atmosphere about him. He was a creepy little fella. A clearer picture of Cook was emerging. But was there any clear evidence beyond Bailey's taped admission that linked Cook to Mark Tilsley's murder? Cook claimed he wasn't in Wokingham on that June day in 1984 when Mark Tilsley disappeared. He claimed he'd never been there. But for years, the police have had evidence that Cook lied. They knew that on the day of the fair, a lorry driver stopped to pick up a hitchhiker. I stopped. I said, where are you going, mate? He said, oh, he said, up country. I said, well, I'm making my way to Camberley, Wokingham, and back to Reading. That'd do me, he said. So anyway, gets in the cab, off we goes. The collar around the neck, it was absolutely disgusting. You could, well, you could grow potatoes around the collar. It was absolutely disgusting. And the, the state of his trousers, you could see that it was all grimed in. There was no quality in his shoes. His shoes was hanging off his feet. When he got in the cab, I regretted picking him up, I must admit it. Shane Northway was relieved when they finally drove into Wokingham. He said, oh, anywhere here do drive. So I said, right, fair enough, so I pulls in the lay-by. And the last I saw of him was when he walked away from the truck and he was walking down on the outskirts of the fairground and that was the last I saw of him. Police files document other witnesses who saw a man fitting the same description later in the day. That afternoon, Mark Tildesley was in the town centre and went into the local sweet shop. A woman who worked there knew Mark and remembers to this day the last time she saw him alive. Hi, Mark. Hi. Sweet well, it was a Friday. We were very busy in the shop. Only 50 peas were. Okay. At the moment, it was a bit slack, and then all of a sudden, a man came in with Mark Tildesley. I smelled, I felt some unusual smell. He smelled very awful, that man. Staring eyes and unruly hair. And he was with Mark. And I didn't think no more of it, you see. Um, okay. And I remember he handed 50p over for me, for the sweets, which Mark, I think Mark shows them himself. According to police files, more than a dozen people remember seeing Cook or a man like him with a boy fitting Mark's description just hours before he was abducted. One witness who knew Mark saw him with a man at the fair. That witness was probably the last person who knew him to see Mark alive. She was too frightened to appear on this program but told me we were by the bumper cars and I saw this man with his hair going back. He stood there watching the bumper cars going round and round. The next time I looked, he was in a bumper car with Mark. He kept looking at the boy. For 15 years, there's been evidence of another man, not Bailey, luring Mark to his death. And there was one final piece of evidence found in the most unlikely of places linking Mark Tildesley's abduction to Sidney Cook. Remember John Purvo, the man who'd sold his Jaguar car? The man he'd sold it to was Sidney Cook. He hadn't got all his money, so he took the car back. As he sorted through the rubbish and fairground trinkets Cook had left behind, he found something that was to prove significant. In the car there was loads of bits and pieces, badges and some chains and such like. Um, there was a couple of pieces of clothing, uh, trolley jack, spare tyres. Um, there was a key ring in there that my brother found of a tiger. It was broken and I threw it back in the car. John Purvo could never have known how important that broken tiger key ring was. When Mark went off to the fair, did he have anything with him, any... Any clues that might help? Yeah, he had that jacket on with a big lawn on the back, and then his monkey boots with the yellow laces, and then he had a, a key ring, it was. Remember when the tiger in the tank came out? 
and he had one of those and the feet were broken on it. Was this a key ring given out by petrol stations? Yeah, his father gave it to him. For months, the police had been searching for the key ring. When they traced John Purvo, they were two weeks too late. The critical evidence with the car had just been quite literally scrapped. The police turned up at the house about two, two and a half weeks later. They were looking for the car. I then explained to him, yes, the car was mine. Uh, I was selling it to Sid Cook. He hadn't paid the money and I had informed him that if he didn't, I would take the car back. I have taken the car back and I told him that I had crushed the car. At this point, one of the police officers started to cry. Do you know where they found it? No, I don't. I'd like to know. You don't know where they found it? No, I don't know. They found it in the back of a car that had once belonged to Sidney Cook? They are. They are. That's the question answered. The evidence, unfortunately, was gone. Um, uh, had we have been able to get that, that tiger um, it would have, of course, made it a lot stronger, but, but I, I still think that was good, strong evidence. They may not have had the key ring, but the police did have those witnesses. Witnesses who'd seen the smelly man in Wokingham on the day Mark died. One of them not only remembered him, but seven years after Mark went missing, could put a name to him. Uh, the third and eldest man, 65-year-old Sidney Cook, I watch television and all of a sudden comes that picture on the screen, which was the same man. And I jumped out of the chair and I said to my husband, this is the man who was in the sweet shop. And I was drinking a cup of tea and a cup dropped on the floor because I could laugh like that. No? And you're absolutely... I'm absolutely sure it is him. If I would see him now like I see you, I would tell him to his face. I'm absolutely sure. Margaret and other witnesses were taken by detectives to an identity parade. We went down on one Saturday morning because it was, it was difficult to arrange these things um, with six witnesses who had, uh, we thought, may be able to identify Cook. Now, bearing in mind we were some seven years later, I'll be quite truthful, I was very, very sceptical that anybody would pick him out went in there the first time round he was standing at number two so I picked him out I came out I went and sat down then they asked me if I'll go through again so I said yep no problem went through and they moved him from number two to number six so I went through picked him out again I looked and I said yeah that's him just like that I know yes I went one screen I looked and I said that's him what what was special about him what what made it so clear that it was his him? eyes his eyes, perhaps his bone structure in his face, I, I'm not sure, but I know it was him. When the first person picked it out, you think, oh, that's wonderful. And the second one picked it out, and, and of the six, four people positively identified Cook as being somewhere in the Wokingham area on that, on that day, the 1st of June, 84. That was wonderful. Identification evidence is notoriously unreliable. I've often challenged it before. In other cases, I've reinvestigated. But the ID evidence against Cook for the murder of Mark Tilsley was never tested because the case simply didn't get to court. He wasn't charged with Mark's murder, and there wasn't enough evidence to charge him with Barry Lewis's. Which is why, after serving a reduced sentence for the Jason Swift killing, he's now a free man. In part three, why Sidney Cook was not charged with the murders of the two small boys. Meanwhile, the police are still ready to take your calls if you have any further information about Sidney Cook. The files from the Mark Tilsley case represent a seven-year investigation thousands of man-hours of work, more than 2,000 witness statements, and, as the police now ruefully admit, just so much wasted effort. Once we started building up the case of Mark Tildesley, and Cook was identified by people in Thames Valley as being the perpetrator, we were confident then that we had built, uh, we were building, but had built a case by the, the final stages that was sufficient to take it to court. 
the police were confident. They had Bailey's cell confessions about what had happened to Mark in the caravan. They had four witnesses who had positively identified Cook as the man they'd seen in Wokingham on the day Mark Tilsley disappeared. They had three witnesses who knew Mark and saw him that day with a man fitting Cook's description. And 13 witnesses who said they'd seen Cook or a man like him at the fair, often with a small boy. And they knew about the key ring. The police presented their evidence to the CPS, the authority responsible for bringing prosecutions. What happened next devastated the detectives involved. I was uh, really very angry at the attitude of the barristers and the CPS representatives when they said they weren't going to prosecute. It uh, just defied belief from my point of view. The final meet meeting lasted two hours and uh, I'll, I'll never forget that the last sentence was, well, well you understand, Mr. Short, you, you do agree with us, don't you? And, and I said, no, I don't agree with you. I, I, I never will. I believe this case should go before the court. I had spent 30 years as a police officer evaluating evidence to take before the courts. And uh, I believe that I was uh, very nearly as qualified as them in assessing what evidence we had to, to take before a court. And I believed that we had the evidence. The prosecuting authorities had been given the relevant files weeks earlier. They contained what the police thought was strong and sufficient evidence. But one policeman felt the CPS hadn't been as involved in preparing the case as he'd hoped, or given as much help as he'd asked for. I, um, on three, four occasions in writing, wrote to the CPS, asked for a liaison officer, um, to be provided to come down to the incident room to sit with me to go through the evidence um, to perhaps give me guidance as to, to how we could strengthen the case you, you know I, I'm not sat here thinking that I've got all the answers I know everything I would have welcomed um, somebody from the, from the CPS to come down and say you know, we think you've got a, a reasonable case but it needs strengthening here this um, that was never ever ever done a confidential internal police memo written at the time shows the frustration the police felt in their belief that they weren't getting the cooperation from the CPS they thought the case deserved. I find it most unusual that I, nor any other officer, have been invited to the last two case conferences. I'd have thought it was impossible to fully examine the evidence in such a complex case without the benefit of an officer who's been dealing with the investigation for so long. The Crown Prosecution Service formally rejected the case at a meeting with the officers involved. And, you know, one of the things they said, well, you know, Bailey, he's a convicted man. Um, how can we believe him? But he had told the truth. He, he had told us about three murders. So why should he tell lies? There was other evidence, corroborative evidence, about Cook being seen at the fair, being picked out on identification parades, about the key fob. The police simply couldn't come to terms with the conclusion of the legal establishment that as far as Mark's death was concerned, there was no case for Sidney Cook to answer. And to add fuel to their frustration, new evidence was emerging that Cook had been at the fair in South London, close to where six-year-old Barry Lewis went missing that fatal weekend. It was the Woolworth Festival and we had had for a couple of years the concession for the kiddies around a couple of roundabouts and stalls and different kiddies things and it was a great big park and there were uh, other stalls, fate stalls, go running around in like an arena and after we'd got erected and one of, one of us walked around to look on the other side of the arena, past the bandstand, was Sid, it's in Sid. How sure can you be that he was there? Oh, I could stake my life on it. He was definitely there. Sid was definitely in Woolworth Park for the Woolworth Festival on the Saturday. The Barry Lewis went missing on the Sunday because we were in on a Saturday. The park is just a few streets away from the estate where Barry's thought to have been abducted. Who can we believe? Trisha Nail or the man she calls Hissing Sid? In the course of making this programme, I've met two young men who say they were abused by Sidney Cook. The police believe them, 
And if their allegations were proved in court, Sidney Cook would be jailed for life. But the problem is, both are vulnerable. Both have severe learning difficulties. They wouldn't make good witnesses. One told me he was befriended by Cook, taken to a house, and forcibly buggered. Today he's so traumatized that he could only talk to me holding a furry toy animal in front of his face. He's 32 years old. The second man, Terry, also lives in the shadow of what happened to him 13 years ago on the Kingsmead estate. Terry, too, finds it hard to talk about, but he told his sister he wants to help. He was out playing and um, he came running into the house crying, saying that a man had hurt, his, hurt him behind. And um, Mum had a look, we had a look, and he was bleeding from behind. He was um, hysterical. He was crying, um, saying that his victim hurts. Terry told his sister that a man had done something to him by the side of a canal that ran past the Kingsmead estate. Your brother is handicapped. Was he able to put up any sort of a resistance? Um, next to nothing. Next to none, really. He's smaller than his, than his rightful age. He's um, built smaller than his rightful age. So, I mean, a big man to a small child. He's got no, no resistance at all, has he, really? Terry is so damaged by what happened to him that he can only talk about it with his sister's help. Where did he take her? Bushy. To where? Bushy. The bushes. And where were the bushes? Facing where we lived then and to where we live where? Down where we lived. Down where we lived. And what did you do when you was in the bushes? Hmm? You saw that? What did you do when you was in the bushes? Oh, you can tell him. Perhaps you can tell us what he told you. He said that um, he said that he took him to the bushes and um, he took down Terry's trousers and he um, touched his front and put his fingers up his back. Terry says he was attacked by the same man not once but twice, but he had no idea who he was until years later. When they was all plastered all over the um, on TV, on the news, and um, about the gang, um, is it paedophile again? Um, Terry pointed out the man that done it. The family were watching the news coverage of the Jason Swift killing. And Terry just frozen. That's the man. That's the man. Sort of thing, you know. And that's how we knew who it was. I mean, he said those words, did he? That's yeah, that's. It was shaking. That that was the man. That was the man. Did he point at the screen? Yeah, because they had pictures of them separately, like coming up, names of who it was and whatever, and Terry just pointed to that one. And then we showed him the paper the next day to see if it was right, and he pointed him out again. And who was that man? Um, as I know now, Sid Cook. Can you ask Terry how he, how he managed to identify the person on the television? How did you manage to do that, Tom? How did you recognise him? By his face. There's a view that there's no point in pursuing an old man and confronting him with half-remembered crimes the police say he's committed. Bailey is dead, murdered in prison by other inmates. But other members of the gang will soon be free, and we believe they have plans to meet Cook. He's in good health, good shape, um, went to great lengths to prove how healthy he was, and at 71 years of age, I believe now, he did press-ups and sit-ups. Why should he stop now? Where is he? Who's looking after him? Are we still looking after him? Is he still being looked after through the public purse? Because if that's the case, then it's a funny old sort of justice we've got in this country, isn't it? The police are following up the two new cases of assault dispatches have uncovered. They've spoken to the two young men involved and they're planning to interview new witnesses. And of course, any new victims or witnesses who come forward as a result of today, tonight's programme. A picture on television brought Terry's ordeal back to him. And perhaps this television programme will prompt others to come forward. 
For 30 years, Sidney Cook was at any number of fairgrounds, fun fairs, school fates, firework displays, where he set up his children's test your strength machine, specifically designed to attract the young. If Sidney Cook crossed your path, the police want you to get in touch with them on 0800 328 0537. Already in the 50 minutes or so since this programme started, we've had some useful leads. The detectives here are already processing the material. And I can tell you that we now know of at least one other man who claims to have been a victim specifically of Sidney Cook. We've also been contacted by others who say they were victims of the gang. We'll bring you a full update on progress at a quarter past midnight. Meanwhile, from dispatches and the incident room, good night. Thank you.